Good evening, blithe spirits and fellow travellers. Welcome along to the Neil Oliver Show on GB News TV, radio and online. Tonight on the show, Colonel Douglas McGregor will be here to discuss a new law that would allow vetted and qualified migrants an expedited path to US citizenship if they serve in the military. I'll be asking Natalie Morris, co-host of the Redacted podcast, what she thinks of the Kamala Harris fever which seems to have taken hold in the United States of America. And we will be asking a financial expert what caused stock markets around the world to plummet this week, losing billions, if not more, in value. All of that coming up, plus plenty of chat with my brilliant panellist, Greg Swenson. But first, an update on the latest news headlines. Who do Keir Starmer's Labour Party work for? As the ruling party of Britain, they are, notionally at least, supposed to serve the British people. I ask the question, who does that parliament work for? Because only a person paying no attention whatever to all that's happening could accept the latest efforts are shaped with the well-being of the British people in mind. Prime Minister Keir Starmer has already said that, given a choice between being at Davos with the unelected, unaccountable billionaires, or in Westminster, listening to the elected representatives of the British people, he prefers Davos. I bet he does. Whoever he serves, it's not the rank and file out there trying to earn livings, hoping to see their children educated as critical thinkers, trusting that their hard-won efforts might be passed on to their descendants. Before anyone suggests Starmer's labour is working instead with the well-being of Muslim people in mind, or indeed for any of the general population, I say that's for the birds. In October last year, when asked on LBC whether Israel had the right to cut off water and power, the right to besiege Gaza, Starmer said that yes, Israel had that right. Tens of thousands of women and children are dead in Gaza now. I say Starmer has been no friend, no sincere or consistent friend, whatever, of Islam either. To imagine Starmer sides with any everyday people is, I say, also for the birds. I say Labour's stance here in Britain is shaped with the intention of dismantling the edifice of Britain brick by brick, levelling it into the image of Airstrip One, that province of the totalitarian superstate involving the renaming and repurposing of Britain as imagined by George Orwell in his novel 1984. I say Starmer and those around him, more specifically those he actually listens to, are using the groups so effectively divided one from another as the explosive mix with which to blow the place, so to speak, to bits. I say the uni party, Labour, Tory, pick your poison, has no love for Britain, and despises the people rooted here, that population the Uniparty regards and seems determined to treat as impacted wisdom teeth they would rather see extracted. It also seems to me that Starmer and his ilk are so convinced of their rightness, of their moral and ideological superiority, that anyone with a different point of view is automatically ignorant, a thug, an oaf, a member of a lesser species. By word and deed, Starmer's Labour and the rest of the Uni Party regard tens of millions of born and bred British people with contempt, unbridled contempt, making him only the latest in a long line similarly minded. Decades of popular opposition to mass immigration, opposition dismissed and ignored by one government after another has boiled over. There's no denying it. The unrest was predicted at least as long ago as the 1960s. What's not said often enough, however, alongside that truth, is that the unrest has proven, surely beyond reasonable doubt, to have been not collateral damage, some sort of unintended consequence born of well-meaning naivety, but the deliberate intention all along. People say to me that Britain's broken, and it surely is. Entire communities denied hope, denied hope for homes, denied hopes of decent jobs, hopes of decent schools for their kids denied hopes of better lives, condemned instead to an ever-decreasing spiral of lost freedom. Britain's traditional culture of hard work and hard workers has been replaced with a culture of dependency, of hopelessness. Britain is indeed broken, but what is most important to understand, I say, is that Britain was deliberately broken. 
Successive administrations looked on at a Britain that worked, literally and metaphorically, with domestic industries, domestic sources of energy, and set about its dismantling planned demolition with a view to replacing a capable, functioning place with a dysfunctional dystopia inhabited by a dependent, submissive population dumbed down into compliance with endless supplies of seductive convenience. Convenience that's illusory, I say, self-applied manacles instead. Starmer is a lawyer to trade and must surely be familiar with the concept of malice aforethought, of mens rea, the guilty mind. Unhappy, desperate, appalling consequences resultant from the deliberate, and I do mean deliberate, flooding of incumbent populations with millions of incomers from elsewhere, from anywhere, incomers with radically different ideas about how to live, were predicted not just in the UK but all across Europe. I say the flooding was and is deliberate, and I fail to see how any honest person confronted with the evidence could say otherwise. Now the consequences are before our eyes and what is the response of Starmer and his government? The knee-jerk response in the face of those he and they regard as lesser, as oafish and thuggish because they do not appreciate the rate of change imposed upon their communities? It's to seek to bully and to frighten millions of people into keeping their mouths shut, their phones in their pockets. The reaction to the problem is to target those who would post videos online depicting behaviour the Starmer government insists must not be seen. Not only that it must not be seen, but that it does not exist in the first place. Quote, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. Everyone quotes George Orwell all the time now, but if the cap fits, we might as well wear it. Official policy now, repeated ad nauseum by the mainstream media, put into practice by the police, is to seek to frighten and to silence those who have seen with their own eyes what is happening up and down the country and sought to share that information with fellow citizens. Over and over again, we are bleated at about our precious so-called democracy here in the home of the so-called mother of parliaments. We're told the word comes from Greek and means the rule of the demos, meaning the people. In recent months, I've been schooled in an alternative etymological understanding that suggests instead that democracy means rule by division, even divide and rule, which on present evidence makes a lot more sense. But what do I know? Sometimes I hear the decaying, corrupted circumstances in which we are made to live excused or explained as the consequences of willful blindness on the part of our leaders, but that's an excuse too far for me. The government and the establishment, ideologically captured as they are, are not at all blind. They have instead a clear-sighted, focused intention to remake Britain and the West in their own image. Some people condone the violence resultant from the boiling over of anger and frustration left simmering for 60 years. Some might even encourage that violence. I don't. But I do know the violence is happening. Neighbourhoods are destroying not just each other, but also themselves. And I do know its manifestation between communities up and down the country, all across Europe and the West, and all at the same time, despite popular opposition made obvious by the rising popularity of common sense populist parties here, there and everywhere, that the boiling over of hitherto stifled and repressed emotion is the fault not of everyday people desiring no more than the continuation of everyday lives, but of politicians in service to ideologies bent towards Agenda 2030, and the rest of the anti-human dystopia. Because as sure as God made little green apples, the stoked and choreographed internecine strife we're seeing now, seeing despite the best efforts of the government and the mainstream media to misrepresent it or to hide it altogether, will shortly be used to justify, well, goodness knows what, martial law maybe, or lockdowns for community safety, followed by the rollout of digital IDs and the rest of the ultimate control and surveillance cage. Once again, the mainstream media has a case to answer when the BBC and Sky and others seek to portray one set of protests as peaceful and others as thuggish and racist. This is blatant distortion, fiction driven by an ideological agenda. That same agenda sees the government determined to maintain the fiction, the distortion, on pain of punishment, prosecution and jail time for those judged to have incited hate. That incitement might only be words or pictures online, or in others' words or pictures shared. Elon Musk, love him or loathe him, appears to be under attack for maintaining his online platform X, Twitter, whatever you call it, 
as a means by which citizens are sharing videos and information that exposes the government and the mainstream media lies. The subject, mass immigration, like others preoccupying the minds of millions, is thereby made a minefield into which too many fear to tread. The blunted, overused weapons of name-calling are used relentlessly by the ideologues of the government and aided and abetted by the mainstream media to make dissent a form of social, professional and reputational suicide, racist, Islamophobe, anti-Semite and on and on until too many people simply shut up and put up with what they know is wrong. My friend, academic and philosopher Ralph Schulhammer said something this week that resonated powerfully with me. He talked about how populations have the right to demand their governments preserve the values of their ancestors. He said countries do not exist only in the present tense, in the here and now, but that they are in fact social contracts between the dead, the living and those who are yet to be born. Here's the thing, people are angry and justifiably so. The stoking of that anger has been the deliberate work of decades indignity and anxiety piled on indignity and anxiety. As much as anything else, people are angry because they've not been listened to, because they've been ignored. And so what does the government do in the face of people desperate to cry out in anger, desperate to be listened to? The government's immediate reaction is to shut those people up, to silence them. Glam's Castle, birthplace of the Queen Mother, is said to be haunted by a ghost they call the Tongueless Woman. The story goes that her tongue was cut out just before she was executed and that her wraith roams the grounds pointing at her bloodied mouth. She wasn't punished for telling lies. On the contrary, she was silenced forever because she had come upon a terrible truth and threatened to repeat what she had learned. We've learned so many terrible truths these few years just past. We had started to call them out. Now we run the risk of playing into the hands of those who would have us silenced again. We need honest voices more now than ever. Next on the show, Colonel Douglas McGregor will be here to discuss a new law that would allow vetted and qualified migrants an expedited path to US citizenship by serving in the military. But before we get to all of that, Greg Swenson, from Republicans Overseas UK is here with me. Uh, Greg, you listen to me possibly more often than is good for you. <laughs> I can only apologise. Uh, but what, what, never, might be never an, what might be an American's perspective on what is happening here in Britain right now? Right. It's, it's interesting to see. I was away for three weeks and came back, see what happens when I leave the country. Yeah, uh, do that. But, but it's similar to what's happening in the U.S. So from an American's perspective, it's not outrageous because we look at what happened over the last 10 or 12 years. You had the, you know, the first rebellion against the mainstream media and the government over-controlling people's lives was the Tea Party back in 2009-10. And, of course, the mainstream media and the government made fun of those people and, you know, tried to describe them as extremists and hicks and, and hokey because they were just regular people, mostly in, in the middle of the country, you know, not on the coast. And so, you know, the, it's that kind of pushback that is healthy, but it's, it's a powerful force to fight against between the, the media and the government. It's powerful. We, we often see traditionally here in the UK that something starts in the US and then we yeah. catch it. It crosses the Atlantic, but is there a sense this time that the way that our present government is yeah. going about the business of handling community strife, right. I would say has been deliberately choreographed and driven, is, is, is ahead of even the American game and that are Americans looking on at what's happening here and thinking, oh my God, maybe, that'll surely come here. Maybe they hope, maybe, I hope they actually take a hard look at it. Charles Murray wrote a great book about 12 years ago called Coming Apart. And it talked about a lot of this strife in these, in these communities, the Rust Belt communities that have been gutted. And, and yet we still wave in immigration. We still replace factories with with cheap labor, uh, you know, factory workers. So, you know, this, this has been going on for a long time in both countries. The question is, you know, when does the pushback really start? I think the pushback started in the U.S., you know, surely started against the pushback against wokeism. And, and I think it's healthy. But you do have, you still have this, this George, you know, this Orwellian 
uh, discussion or description of what's going on. And if you oppose it, if you fight back, then you're a racist, you're an Islamophobe. And so it's really the boutique issues of the elite that have been forced down the throats of the people. And, and that's not healthy, and I think there will be, but, uh, but it looks like you know, the, the pushback here has started, and hopefully it works. I think, though, that they're pushing the, those boutique issues as part of a smokescreen to cover what's yeah. actually happening. And, and although five years ago, if you'd said to me, do you think that the establishment and, and whatever government is in power is working systematically and deliberately to dismantle Britain, I would have laughed that off. I would have said, no, don't be ridiculous. But increasingly, I find that the evidence of my own eyes makes it inescapable. And you know, yeah. Sun Tzu said, an evil ruler will burn his nation to the ground just to rule over its ashes. Yeah, it's that, whole, that old Marxist belief that you have to wreck it and then build it from scratch, from nothing, because they want to try this utopian society. They are trying to wreck America. They've succeeded in several, in several states, California for sure, Minnesota for sure, Illinois, my home, my home state. They're trying their best in New York. They're trying to wreck these communities and wreck these states. And, but people vote with their feet and they move to red states. So thrive in Florida, Tennessee, Texas, Idaho, thriving states, thriving communities. And people are just saying no. And so, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it today, about Tim Waltz, the, the vice presidential nominee. You know, he's tried his best to wreck Minnesota. And he's perhaps succeeding, and you've seen $5 billion of taxable income leave the state. People are moving to North Dakota. They're not, not, they're not just moving for the weather in Florida. They're moving to North Dakota, which is arguably worse weather than Minnesota. And, and because there's freedom in, in that state, and you don't have that that the government forcing their hand with the assistance of the mainstream media. So I think it's, you're seeing the healthy revolt. It's, it's a little easier in the U.S. because you have this federalist system and these 50 different experiments, and 25 of those experiments are working, and 25 surely aren't. Oh. Next on the show, Colonel Douglas McGregor will be here to discuss a new law that would allow vetted and qualified migrants expedited path to UK citizenship if they serve in the military. You're watching The Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. A proposed new law would allow vetted and qualified migrants a speedy path to US citizenship if they serve in the military. America started the year with its smallest military in more than eight decades at just over, I think it's 1.2 million, uh, the lowest total since before the end of the Second World War. Uh, so will this new bill strengthen the US military in any meaningful way? I'm joined now by retired US Army Colonel Douglas McGregor to discuss this. Good evening, Colonel. Always good to see you. Good to see you, Neil. Um, I, I believe it's being bandied about as the Courage to Serve Act. Hmm. Uh, what will it mean? Can you, can you uh, educate my viewers about what it will mean for the United States of America and, and her citizens? I think it will mean uh, certainly a reduction in our readiness to fight. I think it will affect our overall efficiency and effectiveness very negatively. And we need to understand that we've been through some of this before. During the American Civil War, we imported huge numbers of Europeans uh, to come to the United States and serve in the army against the South because we'd taken heavy casualties. We were having trouble replenishing the ranks. And uh, the promise was you serve in this for three years or went to the point where the war ends and then we'll award you citizenship. We found that those formations, when they were subjected to heavy fire, were the first to break and fall back. And ultimately, we had hundreds of thousands of desertions. Uh, the rates of desertion were very, very low among the native-born Americans, but very high among the foreigners. And I would expect something similar. Our, our concern as American citizens right now is that this is part of the denationalization effort that is ongoing in Washington to turn the uh, Army and Marines as a minimum, probably as much of the forces they can, into a foreign legion manned by people who are, for the most part, non-Europeans, uh, which is part of this larger denationalization, flood the country with people that have nothing in common with us, are not here to assimilate, 
did not come here for a specific reason to become Americans, are simply here with a, looking for a ticket to the consumption machine. Uh, uh, what is the, what <clears throat> is envisaged for these uh, these incoming people? Will they be will they be will they be uh, fighting uh, enemies, foreign or domestic? What will they be for? Well, that's the that you ju you've just hit on the key uh, aspect of this whole thing. We've made it very clear uh, in recent years because of the enormous problems we've had and all the failed interventions, many of our best soldiers, uh, officers have left. And so we've said, no, we're not going to commit ourselves to any more massive uh, interventions on the ground. We're going to rely primarily on air and naval power. So many people watching this have concluded that it certainly is the case in the Army and the Marines. Uh, where these people will be foreigners in uniform and could conceivably be used against us, the native-born population. So naturally, we oppose it. Uh, bear with me, Colonel. Greg Swenson from Republicans Overseas with me in the <clears> studio. <throat> what do you make of it? Are you an American citizen? You, you look on at that. How does that make you feel, the thought of a, a, a foreign legion deployed within your country yeah. and possibly sent overseas it's, it's, on your behalf? It's the ultimate outsourcing. Right? We've done this with factories, we've done this with, with industry, and now they want to do it in the military. So I, I agree with the colonel. I mean, it's outrageous. And, and we shouldn't be surprised, by the way. Look what they've done in the last five or, five or so years with the, you know, the woke emphasis in the military, with the DEI. The military's become an HR department, basically. They threw, I think it was 8,000 or more soldiers, sailors, and Marines out of the service because they refused to be vaccinated. And, and didn't reinstate them. So you have, you have all this kind of insane wokery that's depressing the people, the young people that would normally want to enroll and, and enlist. Colonel, Greg, Greg uh, invokes the spirit of insane wokery there. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, who does think this is a good idea in Washington? Where, where is this coming from? Well, I think the uh, hardcore left uh, that is for the denationalization of the country that would like to pursue vigorously the replacement of the native-born Americans, people who are fundamentally anti-Christian and believe that uh, white supremacy or white Christian nationalism are the greatest threats to the country. <clears throat> the, the trouble with all of this is that you know you can get all the what I would call white supremacists together in a phone booth and let the three of them fight over the phone. That's a non-issue, but it's part of the, the diatribe that we hear from the left. It's part of the transformation process. You can link this to globalism, the WEF, uh, your own ruling class uh, is equally inclined in these directions. Anything that is Native American, Christian, and effectively part of Western civilization is being treated as the enemy. So this is one way to get at it. And I think the great danger is they think that these troops can be used against us. I, I've spoken to various people over the months. Uh, Brett Weinstein comes to mind, yourself, others, Michael Yawn, talking about invasion, using that word, using that vocabulary about what's happening on the southern border. Now, how even more alarming for, well, uh, 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 for American citizens that mm. the, the invasion force is actually armed and uniformed. That's exactly right. And here's something else to consider. I talked about efficiency and effectiveness. Most of the people coming into this country are not coming in with the skills that we would look for in modern military uh, organizations. These are not well-educated people. They're not going to march seamlessly into the economy and hold down jobs as engineers, accountants, and so forth. Uh, the problem is you're not getting the quality manpower that you need today in the armed forces. The days of uh, bringing in people that had almost no education and, and frankly were ignorant and could have a rifle shoved in their hands and sent to the front are over. We, we need quality people that can man uh, lots of uh, complex equipment and technology. This is not gonna happen. So the only purpose here is to further the denationalization of the United States. The denationalization of the United States of America. What a, what a prospect. Colonel Douglas McGregor, I've only run out of time where I would keep this conversation going because I find it so fascinating and frightening. Uh, but thank you so much for your contribution so far. Thank you, Neil.
Coming up next, I'll be asking Natalie Morris, co-host of the Redacted podcast, of which I am a, 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 a regular viewer, what she thinks of the Kamala Harris fever, which well, I think has definitely taken hold in the USA. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. It's been another busy week in American politics. I can't get enough of it at the moment. And the momentum currently building behind Democrat candidate Kamala Harris shows no sign of abating. Latest polling figures suggest Kamala Harris is now leading Republican candidate Donald Trump, who had been comfortably ahead when Joe Biden was still intending to run. Is Kamala Harris, the current vice president, enjoying a honeymoon period with the voters? Or is this something more significant? I'm joined now by the co-host of the most excellent redacted podcast, Natalie Morris. Thank you for joining us, Natalie. It's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, sh shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, sh shouldn't we have, have questions to ask about why uh, Americans seem to be uh, being offered the most unappealing cast of characters. Yes, I think it's fair to call her unappealing, but I think it worked to her advantage to be in the shadows for four years because now she's not being blamed for the failures of the Biden administration. So people are kind of like, oh, she's there. She's a woman. She's a person of color. She's somebody who speaks in a kind of like, hey, we represent minorities type of way. And so I can say that I understand this because I voted for Barack Obama under those same kind of faux inspirational slogans. And I missed it for eight years that he was waging war on the Middle East, that he was literally committing war crimes and that Hillary Clinton was kind of holding his hand, waging war in Syria, waging war in Yemen, waging war in Somalia. And so it's easy to sort of not understand those things because Americans maybe are not studying and get excited about this archetype. That's what I see as is happening. And so when I see on social media and other places, people who are excited about Kamala Harris, I'm like, why are we not are we not assigning her blame for what the Democratic Party well, has done since the Obama administration? I'm very confused by it as much as I'm just sort of uh, watching. Pre precisely. But 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 you 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 put yourself you, you cast yourself in that role of having been beguiled by the by the machinery that yes. got behind o Obama. But, but in, in, a, in a way that Kamala Harris hasn't been, he, he was much more of an unknown quantity. Uh, Americans have had years worth of footage of Kamala Harris being Kamala Harris. And her, her, uh, her polling was through the floor. It was, lower than, it was lower than anybody almost had ever been. And yet suddenly from the bottom of the well, that polling is, you know, is in the ascendant. Where is the yes, memory and the awareness of the, of the American viewer? It's confusing, but like I said, she flew under the radar for so long because Joe Biden was so fun to watch and because we had a war, we have a recession. She doesn't say anything of substance, so we can sort of pretend that that lack of substance is just her waiting in the wings to pounce, I suppose. That's really the only reason that I can say. And and also that Donald Trump is kind of a, a, a bumbling character. He's a known character. You know, some of the things I've seen online of people who want to be inspired by Kamala Harris is that she may be well-educated. Um, I don't know. Can we call her erudite? She's, she's well, I don't know. Well-educated is not well-spoken. We're seeing that play out increasingly as when she's asked, what is she going to do about inflation? She just explains that it's a problem. So I don't know. Again, I think that it speaks to the fact that if you have a shiny, nice archetype and you can distract with the culture wars, because her main promise for freedom is freedom to have an abortion. There's no other freedom that she stands for. I, we did a segment just this week about all the things that she's promising in terms of freedom. It's not freedom to criticize a war. Heck no. It's not a freedom to uh, criticize the government. It's not a freedom to, to question the pandemic. No, all of those freedoms were taken away during the Biden administration. But she's allowed to, again, I just think she's she's a well-shellacked character 
when you just oppose her with Joe Biden, which is just sad at this point. Greg Swenson, uh, Natalie is is uh, is alluding there to this this slogan, this or this word, freedom, that right. has become the you know the, the the point of the of the Kamala Harris Tim Waltz run for the run for the White House. What do you make of Natalie's uh, you questioning of exactly what they might mean by freedom, yeah, given it, their context? It's just that they just use political slogans, right? She's not done interviews. Kamala has not done interviews, nor has she done press conferences. So it's very well crafted. So the, the campaign and the party are just crafting this image of the, you know, the new and looking to the future and freedom, you know, that people overuse the word freedom, but Natalie is a great point. Freedom, there are, there are no freedoms she's advocating. And I think the collusion between the Biden White House, which she was part of, or well, in spite of trying to distance herself, you know, colluded with social media companies to, to basically keep their narrative definitely with, with um, any kind of skepticism toward vaccines, any kind of skepticism toward mask mandates, but taxpayer-funded abortions up until birth and even no, no protections for a child of a botched abortion, that's savage. And it polls at 13 and it polls at 18 with Democrats. And yet that's what she's leading with. Natalie, so, Natalie when, I, when I heard, uh, I saw your piece about freedom and I immediately thought, I was immediately in, inspired or reminded of the, the Chris Christopherson or Janis Joplin line about freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And I wonder if in fact, consciously or unconsciously, what, what Kamala and, and Waltz and the, and the Democratic Party by extension might be actually subliminally saying to people, what they're offering is freedom from freedom. Stick with right. us and you won't have the onerous burden of freedom and open brackets responsibility. Well, look at what the Biden administration is litigating right now. They are litigating for their freedom to continue to take your freedoms. So when it comes to the excellent point uh, about social media censorship or freedom to continue to. Uh, let's see, redefine gender. That's what they want. Freedom to keep open borders. Now we see several states litigating for the right to close their borders and the Biden administration is litigating against it. They want to say, nope, open borders, you cannot protect yourself. So this freedom is freedom for them. It's freedom for the limitless, limitless kingmaker type power that they are hungry for because the Democrats are the company guy for big big government. And that's not to say that Republicans are they have no spine. They're not standing for anything. They're not showing us what they actually could do in terms of shrinking government or bringing us freedoms. But at the same time, the Democrats are doing this hoodwink in terms of freedom because it's really freedom for government, not for people. Oh, you've raised even more subjects about which I could talk to you for the next hour at least, but Natalie Morris, time is against me. I cannot recommend strongly enough that people uh, tune in to watch Redacted, yourself and Clayton you. uh, doing the job uh, as independent journalists that the mainstream media is so often refusing or anyway failing to do. Natalie Morris, it's been lovely to hear your perspectives. Likewise, likewise, I, I really enjoy your show as well. And uh, we we study really hard to diver, deserve our audience. And I can tell that you do too. So uh, we're bookish we will... nerds who are trying to get the truth. <laughs> Indeed we are. We will talk again. Natalie Morris, thanks so much. Coming up next, we'll be asking a finance expert what caused stock markets around the world to plummet this week, losing billions in value, we're told. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. Financial turmoil hit stock markets around the globe this week. The US stock market saw its biggest daily drop in almost two years, while 40 billion was wiped off the FTSE 100 on Monday. Were these somewhat random fluctuations or worrying signifiers that a recession may be around the corner? To discuss it, I'm joined by Andy Sheckman, president and owner of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. Great to see you again, Andy. Neil, thanks for having me, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate it. Great stuff. Now, uh, the stock market this week, 
was that uh, uh, blips or was it the beginning of the end? I keep hearing threats of the hurricane looming. Uh, my guest here in the studio, Greg Swenson, is talking about cracks or there in the, in the US economy. What, what significance should we take from what happened this week? Uh, I mean, it's look, it's the largest single one day point drop in the index's history. It's a big deal. It, the biggest drop in, in the history of the, the Nikkei, uh, biggest drop we've seen in I don't know how many years. Uh, Taiwan, 57 years, uh, South Korea since uh, the great financial crisis. It's not something to be underestimated. And, and, you know, what I really think the big, big issue is, is that similar to the United States, similar to what was witnessed in the United Kingdom when when rates when they tried to raise rates, saw what happened to the pension system. Well, Japan tries to raise rates a little bit, strengthen their their currency and all hell breaks loose. The Nikkei starts to collapse and it starts to reverberate around the world this japan carry trade is a big deal but what it signifies to me is just how much we are trapped between austerity and inflation can we normalize the balance sheet or do we have to give in to inflation and what does that lead to so it really signals to me that due to the suppression of interest rates for a very long time all of these governments have painted themselves into a corner and you can see what happens when you try to normalize. Just trying to normalize a little bit creates a, a catastrophic chain reaction all the way around the globe. But it's not a good sign, really, is it, Neil? Uh, for the longest time, it has felt like a can that was able to be kicked ever further down the road. But that was underwritten by the, the US hegemony and the US dominance of, of everything financial, the petrodollar, the, the reserve currency and all of the rest of it. But as I understand it as a financial novice, that time is either over or coming to an end. And we have the rise of phenomena, if I can use that word, like the M bridge, uh, like the gold backed uh, unit, which is a, a token of currency for the BRICS nations. There are so many alternatives now to US hegemony that what had been a can to kick down the road now feels as if it, it might finally be being confronted in real time. Yeah, I mean, the can was able to be kicked down the road, Neil, because of confidence, confidence in the United States, confidence in the world reserve currency. We are a country right now that is creating, get this, $100,000 worth of debt one, two per second, five, six, seven, and go on as long as you can keep snapping 100,000 in debt every second, 24 seven. That's a trillion dollars worth of debt every 100 days. It took 200 years to do it the first time. So we are destroying the value of the currency. And when you talk about confidence, that is what backs this currency right now. It used to be backed by gold, right? And then you could argue loosely the petrodollar, which Saudi Arabia just a few weeks ago said, listen, we're not going to sign, re-sign the exclusivity deal. We'll still take dollars, but we're opening it up. And that immediately killed the hegemony. Didn't kill the supremacy yet. But when you look at the way things are being conducted in the United States, both from a standpoint of, of, of massively irresponsible fiscal policy, spending like we're, we're addicted to, you know, like, like a drug addict who can't get off the drug and we continue to spend and spend and borrow. And we look at the United States and the United Kingdom as an example, one broke nation borrowing from another broke nation. The UK is buying all the debt from the US right now. I mean, it, it, it's almost laughable. And when you talk about what this truly means, yeah, we have lost confidence, not only in the way we manage our currency, but we've weaponized the dollar against a country like Russia. This has nothing to do with my feelings on Russia. But when you take five billion dollars of Russian assets and use the proceeds to give to the Ukraine, a country they're in the midst of a war uh, with in the form of weapons, that's a line you don't come back from. And you're seeing the same thing with you with the European Union taking the interest on 280 billion of Russian assets and using it to fund a loan to the Ukraine. These are our problems where which are chipping away at the trust. And when you talk about mismanagement of the currency, weaponization of the Treasury market, and then just what's happening in our country, lawlessness, open borders, questions around the election and the judicial system, it's all chipping away at the full faith and confidence 
of a system that is no longer backed by anything and is leading to the rise of, like you said, Project Enbridge and the unit currency. And I, I'm impressed that you said that because not enough people know about it, but it might be the very biggest thing that the West has faced in a very, very, very long time. And God bless you for having the 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 knowledge to talk about it because really to me it's being way underestimated at its significance uh, bear with me andy uh, with me in the studio greg swenson these really do feel like tumultuous times that we're living in you know i i grew up in a world in which the us was just just the good guy was just the trusted presence the white-hatted cowboy uh, and I, I, I long to live in a world in which that, that might be true, but it doesn't feel true at the moment. And in fact, America has actually managed to cast itself as the hypocrite right. on the world stage by this weaponization of, of the dollar that Andy's talking about. You know, this taking Russian assets, Europe's you know, it's, it's taking and spending the interest on Russian money in, in oh, yeah. European banks. And now the rest of the world, which is where most people live, right. looks on at the US and says, we can't trust these guys. Right, and because and you, you never know who's going to be next. And, and, you know, you have to pick your, you know, you can't pick your enemies, but you have to pick your friends, you know, wisely. And the U.S. hasn't done that, in, 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 at least in the last three years. And so, you know, the Biden administration, and this is where the lack of trust that Andy mentioned comes in. The Biden administration, you know, shut down the, you know, reopened the Keystone pipeline or the XL pipeline, and then when, Russia didn't behave they wanted the way they wanted them to behave, they shut it down again. They cozied up to, you know, they shut down the energy industry in the U.S. And that affects our allies, right? That affected, natural gas prices went up fivefold in the U.K. and Europe, thanks to Biden, you know, stepping on the neck of the U.S. energy industry. It affects world prices, it affects our allies, and so that caused much pain, you know, natural, I mean, uh, fertilizer companies were going out of business here in the UK. So, you know, with friends like that, who needs enemies? And, and so, yes, that lack of trust is increasing. And, and I think then, of course, a year later, Jake Sullivan went to Moscow to beg Putin to pump more oil. Good enough to jump in there, Greg. Coming up next, Iranian academic and political analyst Mohammad Saeed Marandi will be here to discuss fears that the Middle East crisis may escalate. I will see you shortly. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show and welcome as well to those joining me on GB News Online. We're going to continue our discussion about the global financial turmoil which has hit the markets this week. Still with me, Andy Schechtman, president and owner of Miles Franklin Precious Metals and Greg Swenson from Republicans Overseas. Andy, to pick up where we left off, a, a, a conversation, I, it's so potentially huge, world shaping. We mentioned earlier the M Bridge. I wonder if you might give uh, a, 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 as, uh, as best you can in terms of keeping it tight and short, uh, a, 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 an understanding of what the M Bridge is. Yeah, no one's ever accused me of being able to do things tight and short, but I'll do the best that I can for you, Neil. Uh, the Enbridge is a cross-border payment system that was developed between China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and the United Arab Emirates. It was tested last year. Uh, the first two trades were done in uh, digital yuan with United Arab Emirates for gold and for oil, two, uh, two assets for which I believe have been remonetized around the globe, at least in the Southern Hemisphere, to the understanding that oil and gold are worth more than the currencies that we use to purchase them. And Saudi Arabia has just become a full participant in Project Enbridge. This is a very big deal, right? There's about 25 observational countries along with Saudi Arabia, the four countries I mentioned, and the Bank of International Settlements standing behind it. United States dollars are not uh, compatible with Project Enbridge. It's another big deal um, to, to keep in mind. Now, there was a meeting 
Uh, just a few weeks ago in Novograd, Russia, one of the 200 meetings that the BRICS said they would have leaving, leading up to the big BRICS meeting in October, it coincided with the G7 meeting. And the Royal Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia was invited to the G7 meeting in Italy. He turned it down and said, sorry, guys, I'm too busy. But he sent his finance ministers to the meeting in Novograd, where two very big developments came out. One, 59 more countries have formally applied to BRICS. We don't know which ones they are yet, but that was um, disclosed at the, at the end of the meeting. But to your point, another big thing came out of it, and that was an admission by Delma Rousseff. Delma Rousseff, the former president of Brazil and now the head of the BRICS New Development Bank, said she had a meeting on the sidelines, two meetings, with Sergei Glazyev and Vladimir Putin. I've done over 3,000 YouTube videos in the last four years talking about the BRICS currencies or the BRICS countries issuing a currency-backed and commodity-backed currency because of the work of Sergei Glazyev, the Eurasian Economic Union financial minister. He said, this is what we are going to do, took him at face value. So Delma came out and said, listen, we had a meeting on the sidelines and we have agreed in principle uh, to, to issue a new currency called the unit. And the unit will be a gold-backed currency uh, token, if you will, 40% gold-backed, 60% backed by a basket of commodities issued uh, by the BRICS countries, and it will be traded over Project Embridge. Now, Project Embridge, again, Saudi Arabia just became a full participant. U.S. dollar is not compatible with Embridge. The gist of it is simply this. There's been over 40 countries that have repatriated their gold from the Bank of England and the New York Fed over the last year and a half or so. India, as an example, just brought back 100 metric tons they've kept at the Bank of England since 1991. All of these countries would leave their gold at the Bank of England or the New York Fed to give access to the LBMA and to the COMEX, standard safe jurisdictions, Western rule of law, and ability to transact amongst these two platforms. What's interesting, most people would say they're bringing back their gold because they don't trust the West any longer. Counterparty risk, sanctioning, weaponization, but it's not that. If you read the white paper on Embridge, it says very clearly, Neil, that the gold that will be used to mint these tokens will be held within the borders of the countries that possess them. In other words, all of the countries that have been repatriating their gold, like India, they can issue these unit tokens, 40% gold back in kilo bars that are redeemable upon demand. They will be audited in an escrow account. So the bars in the currency, the 60% currency of the BRICS plus nations that comprise the other basket, gold currency held in an escrow account, independently audited continuously with massive penalties for deviation from the from the unit protocol, traded over Embridge, but they can keep it within their own borders. And it is deliverable if one of the countries wants it. So the, the, the bottom line is simply this. Each one of the, there won't be a BRICS currency. Each one of these countries will have their own central bank digital currency, like we see already. If you take all of the world's GDP and the countries that combine to make up that GDP, 99% of those countries have a CBDC, a central bank digital currency, either in development or already in production, uh, working. And so what they said was each country will be able to trade cross-border with their central bank digital currencies, digital yuan to digital real to digital rupee to digital uh, ruble. But settlement for energy will be in the unit token, 40% gold backed, 60% currency backed, but held within your own borders. So when you see all of these countries bringing back their gold from the New York Fed and the Bank of England, it is a massive deal. The because what it really means is if indeed they do ratify this in September, they have a big meeting that they set aside in China just to ratify this with the intention of rolling it out in October. If indeed they do, that eviscerates the need to hold dollars, to buy energy, and to reinvest any proceeds in treasuries. Instead, they'll choose gold, which they're already doing, Neil, because over the last 25 years, gold's performance has doubled that of the 10-year treasury. But what does it offer that the treasury doesn't? No counterparty liability. You can't freeze my gold that I hold in my own borders. You can't confiscate it just like you can the Treasury. Andy, so it gives them freedom from Western suppression the, and no need to hold dollars or treasuries the, anymore. It's a big deal. There's something that sounds, well, it sounds very sophisticated, uh, 
uh, very modern in a sense in that it implies the necessity of cooperation r r rather than coercion. You know, um, America with its weaponizing has, has increasingly been in that place where people were just strong armed into the US way or the highway. All that you're describing there with the with the Enbridge and the gold bat unit, I I implicit within it is nations acting cooperatively, which in and of itself leaves the coercive US with its weaponized dollar looking like it's been left behind in, a, in, a, in an angry, violent past. And the rest of the world is moving forward with something quite different, even tied to gold. Everything that these folks are doing, Neil, is cooperative. You could argue otherwise from a Western perspective, but that's the slant that the Western media wants us to believe. Look at the largest regional military and financial organization in the world that Saudi Arabia has joined along with Iran, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Look at the Belt Road Initiative. 75% of, of human population already, 50% of global G GDP in a cooperative measure to bring under-industrialized countries that are very resource rich to help extract those resources through bridges, roads, maritime channels, oil refineries, gold and silver mines, the ability to harness the resources, to develop the infrastructure and to build, bring it to the marketplace in a cooperative manner. And look at BRICS. This year, the presidency is in Russia. Last year, it was in South Africa. Not positive where it is next year, but the whole genesis of the BRICS is cooperative. Not any one entity holds power for more than a year. So yes, a coercive regime is losing, um, and it's been 500 years, you could argue, that us Westerners have ruled the roost. These new players that are rising in a rallying cry against this hegemony, the Western hegemony, not just the US, but all of us Westerners who for 500 years have ruled the world, you could argue, are now finding, finding uh, safety in numbers, a rallying cry against the hegemony, and in a cooperative manner. It's a big point. I agree completely. Greg, it's it's uh, it really is quite something to look on it. Which I suppose the really the question it begs is when will the West, when will we, when will America waken up to the significance of BRICS, of Enbridge? It, it, it's not about saying good guys and bad yeah. guys. It's just who's got the best tools well, in the game. And I th I think the West has to a certain degree, but make consistently making mistakes along the way. So I think the, the West has embraced, for example, Africa, where I do a lot of business, you know, in, in some ways in competition with Belt and Road, with the Chinese, but also understanding that there are great resources there and there's great potential for the people there. And, and, they tend are, to do a lot of it with bombs and bullets and regime change, where but, where the yeah, where the Belt much, and Road much, technique is much no, more yeah, about. I mean, look, uh, you know, come in, we'll we'll, we'll build some roads, the, you know, we'll the, build an airport. The, the Western Development Finance Financial Agencies or DFIs, Development Finance Institutions, have been active in Africa for a generation or two, and and the rest of the emerging markets yeah. and frontier markets. But I think it, there's value there, an uh, opportunity. Andy, just one last question. How, how significant is it that we're, we see the return of a gold-backed token, call it a currency or whatever? You know, not since whenever, 1970s, uh, have we seen the world looking to gold. How much does that, what does that, that sounds like something very profound from a philosophical point of view. Well, not only is it profound, the Bank of International Settlements, who is behind Ambridge, the most sophisticated bank in the world, you guys, they're they're the puppet master. You know, they're pulling the strings. They're the, the central bank or central bank. They reclassify gold as the world's only other tier one reserve asset in 2019. And ask yourself, do you think there's any coincidence that all of the central banks are buying gold at a level that the world has never seen before over the last several years? And now they're all on a massive repatriation drive. So the fact that gold is the only other tier one asset as far as central banks are concerned, on par with U.S. treasuries and dollars. Since Bretton Woods, it has been dollars and treasuries that have been considered tier one. Now, all of a sudden, it's gold. It's been reclassified in concert with the central banks buying it and taking possession of it because it is an asset that does not have counterparty liability. And, you know, history doesn't always repeat, but it certainly rhymes. And I think we are going full circle again into looking to a system that is completely void of trust uh, through weaponization, through, look, Janet Yellen can say to CNN, hey, you guys, we're okay with Xi and Putin being friends, but if, if, if Xi gives one penny to the Putin war machine, 
we will sanction their banks, their companies, and Beijing itself. Never mind the fact that we've given $260 billion to the Ukraine with no congressional oversight, Stinger missiles and F-16 jets and the intelligence on where to drop the bombs. We don't matter because we're the world reserve currency. The world is tired with this. The rest of the world has become sophisticated, coordinated, motivated, uh, incentivized, wealthy. All of these things are happening in concert with the fact that the West continues to be coercive, continues to create sanctions, continues to destroy the value of our currency through massive money printing. All of this stuff is having ill effects. Got to and jump in there. Got to trust. jump in there, Andy. We I have to have you back. We, we, you've mentioned the Bank for International Settlements, and that's before we even get to fully understanding the logarithmic decay of the petrodollar and the Klohard Piven strategy that we'll talk about another time as well. Thank you so much for being with me tonight. Can't wait you to got talk it, more, my man. You got it. Good to be here, Neil. Hope to see you again soon. Oh, so much more we could have talked about there. I'm exhausted from it. <laughs> yeah, just, just really <laughs> He's sharp. He's coming sharp. up, coming up. We've already heard from the Republican camp on the presidential race today from Greg. Uh, so it's time to see what the Democrat camp are making of it all. I'll be joined by political strategist and former Democrat advisor Hank Scheinkopf. You're watching the Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Welcome back to The Neil Oliver Show. Going to talk now about the ongoing conflict in the Middle East. Uh, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has warned Iran and Israel that the conflict must not be allowed to escalate. Uh, the region has been in turmoil since attacks by Hamas on Israel on October 7, and there are concerns that Iran and allies may launch a new wave of attacks following the recent killings of senior members of Hamas and Hezbollah. I'm joined now by Iranian-American academic and political analyst, uh, Mohammed Syed Marandi, to discuss the latest developments. Thanks for joining me again. Thank you. Um, how much does the, the, the recent death, let's say, of Ishmael Haniyeh um, matter in the bigger picture of this war? What does it tell us? It's not going to change the way in which uh, the resistance in Gaza or the West Bank or elsewhere conducts itself. But it does show that the Israeli regime is not willing to uh, negotiate on the one hand because he was the chief negotiator, he was the political head. But on the other hand, the, the, the very fact that they murdered him in Tehran was a violation of Iranian sovereignty it was an insult to Iran's honor and dignity because he was a guest of Iran. He was staying at the at, at an official guest house where presidents, prime ministers, and uh, other senior foreign officials stay at. So the Iranians feel that they must punish the Israeli regime, especially since this has already happened before. The Israelis bombed the Iranian consulate in April, killing 12 people. When the Iranians took this to the UN Security Council, the US, France, and Britain, as well as the Germans, I think, they uh, refused to allow the Security Council to condemn Israel. So Iran felt it was forced to punish the regime to as a deterrence. Well, now after two, three months, we see they've done it again and they've taken even a step further. So since the US and the West is supporting the Israeli regime, the US, the Iranians have no option but to strike to make them regret what they did to prevent this from happening in the future. If I could turn uh, now to the also recent ICJ, uh, International Court of Justice, about uh, it, it, well, its judgment declaring the Jewish settlements or Jewish settlements in Palestine to be unlawful. Um, how significant also is that uh, you, you know, uh, um, there was also a criticism of what's effectively an apartheid system. Uh, you're preventing the, 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 the subjugated people l living under those uh, conditions from even having a say in, in what they want to have happen. So again, in terms of, you know, you address the significance of the, of the assassination of Mr. Haniyeh. What about the significance of the ICJ ruling? 
it is politically important, but the problem is that the United States will allow the Israeli regime to do anything it wants. Right now, you, you've probably seen the footage of what's happening to Palestinian prisoners in uh, these uh, torture camps. Uh, I don't want to be explicit, but I think many of your viewers have probably seen it by now that it's been out there on online over the last couple of days. We see the genocide taking place in Gaza, and the United States and its allies refuse to uh, yank on uh, the uh, leash of Netanyahu. They allow him to bomb uh, the capital of Lebanon, not just southern Lebanon, but they bombed a civilian residential building to kill a Hezbollah commander, and thus killing women and children and destroying families. And then, of course, the, the, the attack in Tehran. So when the, United, when the United States allows the Israelis to carry out any sort of attack without any consequences and to get more ammunition, more weapons, more financial support, both from Europe and the United States, then what can the ICJ or the ICC really do? What they are doing is they're telling the global south that, look, the Israeli regime is uh, treating the Palestinians as subhuman. But also what it's doing is it's telling the global south that, look at how the West, how look at the sheer double standards of the West, where they're allowing Palestinian prisoners to be uh, violated uh, on, on a regular basis and killed as a result yet they will support the Israelis uh, no matter what the cost. And then they have the audacity to complain to China or Russia or whoever about the human rights. So, Saeed Narandi, what, to what extent would you see, I, I'm really, I'm just asking for an opinion, really. I, I, I appreciate you couldn't be categorical about it, but to what extent would you say that we're dealing with, on the one hand, uh, the, 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 the needs and wants of, of Netanyahu himself and those closest to him, as compared to the broader Israeli regime, you know, in that in that bigger, longer term picture, you know, to what to what extent do you identify some kind of internal conflict there? Well, there are reports that many of the intelligence uh, chiefs in Israel, as well as many high-ranking generals. Uh, in the military are unhappy about the situation. They feel that they've, uh, they haven't they have gained anything in Gaza. Uh, they're exhausted. Uh, they've slaughtered ordinary people, but they haven't been able to uh, take this very small piece of land. On Lebanon, they're stalemate in the Red Sea. The U.S. has failed. So they, they feel exhaustion, but we know that if Netanyahu is forced to step down, that he's probably going to go to jail because of the corruption charges that have been there for years. So he has a very strong incentive, and so do people around him for their own reasons, to continue this war and to escalate and to, if they could, bring in the Americans and others into the war to fight alongside them. Uh, bear with me, uh, Syed Morandi, while I, I also involve Greg Swenson, my guest here in the studio. Uh, it's, so, it's so very difficult to look on at this, isn't it? I mean, to, to some extent, you could look on at what's happening now after all this time since October 7th, and it even appears as though Israel is not even winning the war. Yeah, I think there's been some... Uh, the, the strategy or the, the backing by the U.S., has been incoherent, right? Some some days they're supporting, some days they're telling Israel to you know to step back and don't do this, don't do that. The idea of building a dock on the in the Red Sea that was a joke, um, didn't work, never was intended to work. But you know I think I'm not hearing a lot of reference to October seventh. That you know you I have to understand that the Israelis sometimes have to push the limit, and disagreement is part of a democracy. So I'm not surprised that some generals are, are not happy with how the war is proceeding. Um, we all wish it would end quickly. We wish they could free the hostages. We wish they could, they could win. And so, but the scale, but, but I'm, I'm Greg, not, I mean, we're, we're, I mean the, the, you know, the, um, it has been estimated that we're looking at upwards north of 180,000 people in Gaza, it, killed. It's tragic, the, and, the, and I'm the, sure that the scale, yeah. the the asymmetry, the 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 disproportionate nature of it, it I think, yeah. is really what is making people look on at it. I mean, you know, Russia is looking on now and saying that it can no longer overlook or or uh, ignore any longer what's happening. Yeah, I, I, I'm. 
clearly on the side of the Israelis here, so you know I might have a bias, but I think proportion is a word that's that's misused quite often. It's not, you know, how many did you kill? How many did do we kill in retaliation? It's is there is there a method to is there a military purpose to justify some civilian deaths? I think the Israelis have gone out of their way to avoid those as best they can. They were provoked, and that's why I, I find it. Unsettling to hear from these multi-lat institutions like the International Court of Justice or the UN Security Council, you know, that have very little validity. Uh, Said Mirandi, how how would you how would you react to what you heard my, my guest Greg Swenson say in the studio here? Well, your guest is supporting a regime that has expelled people from their homes in Palestine in 1947, and many of them were living in this concentration call, camp called Gaza since their birth. And they've been regularly bombed by the Israelis long before October the 7th. And the Israeli regime has carried out not only apartheid across this region, but they've regularly bombed people and killed people. As we speak, according to a poll carried out by Channel 12 in Israel, 47% of the Israelis support the rape of Palestinian prisoners, whereas only 45 don't support them. How can anyone side with this. Yeah. We see, we've seen the footage of rape. We know that many people are being raped and killed, not just prisoners from Gaza, but also from the West Bank. The West Bank, which has nothing to do with the, uh, with the battles that are going on in Gaza, they've lost 600 people since October the 7th. That's two a day. So the, the Israeli regime is not only an apartheid regime, not only is it carrying out genocide, it is doing what it claimed happened on op October the 7th. We know now that there is no evidence that there was rape. We know now that there was no evidence of beheadings. They have no footage. But we do have footage today of Israeli soldiers raping bear, Palestinians bear with in me. prison. Bear not with in me. jail. They have to go to jail. Bear with me, uh, Saeed Morandi. Greg. You know, Said Morandi's making his point there, that right. you, and the, the the footage to which he refers you know, is circulating, and and right. th you know things were said and allegations were made about what happened on October seventh, and right. that was a lot of that was revisited and then withdrawn. There, I would, I would, I wonder. I'm I'm sure you want to, you know, you know, you know, push back, but there's no way in which this is looking good is looking appropriate or symmetrical for, for Israel. Is yeah, it? look, I think that there's a lot of pressure on Israel and, and the, obviously Western media hasn't been kind to them, but I don't think it was unprovoked. And I, I think the genocide thing is arguable. I mean, they've had Arabs living in Israel, living and working in Israel and members of the Knesset. I mean, th this is, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't, couldn't make the argument that Israel was unprovoked here. And, and even the, the rape and pillaging on October 7th polls rather well in Gaza as well. So it's, this is not just Israelis having ill feelings toward their neighbors. This was obviously provoked. I, I, I don't know how you could argue that October 7th was some fabrication. No, there, excuse me. There was no, there, yes, there's no evidence. There's no evidence that there was rape on October the 7th. A lot of good work has been done on this. You can go and uh, interview Max Blumenthal. How about burning the great people? Was there any of that? Was there no, burning no. people? The, There's all, no murder. All, everything, everything is well documented. In fact, a lot of the people who died, and it's not clear how many, died as a result of the Israeli air, uh, helicopter gunships and Israeli tank fire because the Israelis were attack they wanted to prevent any of these prisoners or hostages from being taken back into Gaza so they uh, they Im imposed a, a an order on their troops to to strike out at everything that goes to Gaza and there's a lot of footage of this so the the, the Gazans they we have to look and remember that Gaza has been under subjugation for decades it has been under siege for decades. These are people that are striking back at their oppressor. And the, the Israeli regime, they have literally taken their homes away from them. And things are picking up speed, by the way, in the West Bank now. In the West Bank, we see increasing, increasingly violent behavior by the regime, by the, by the government. And look, if you look at the ICJ document that was published Israeli leaders speak about genocide. 
when they speak about uh, Amalek, they said when the prime minister spoke about Amalek, Amalek in the Old Testament, in, in, in biblical uh, stories, they were completely destroyed. They were ordered to destroy their animals, their children, everything. And that's what the Israelis have been doing. In addition to that, they shut from the very from the very beginning. The the president, the Israeli president, said that he said that we're going to block, and so did the defense minister. We're going to block electricity, water, food, preventing food from getting into Gaza. That's been going on for ten months now. And would you say Hamas so, has been innocent? Hold, hold on, yeah. so hold on, Said Marandi. Yes, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I think Hamas has had should take some blame here as well. I mean, they're not exactly you know benevolent and innocent. It's not a benevolent and innocent government, and they've prevented much of the food that's been brought by the Americans and the Israelis from being distributed. So, you know, it's, it's hard to, you know, this moral relativism comparing Hamas to the Israelis is troubling. No moral relativism, Said Marandi. No, there's no evidence that Hamas has been withholding food. It's not in, in Hamas's interest to starve its own people. That is just Israeli propaganda uh, to, to, to justify the ongoing genocide. Hamas is just as immoral as the African National Congress was and Nelson Mandela was in the 20th century. Back then, in, in the UK, Nelson Mandela was, was called a terrorist. The ANC was called a terrorist. And in the United States, he was a terrorist in accordance with U.S. law. They passed a law making Nelson Mandela a terrorist and the ANC a terrorist organization. But then when uh, apartheid finally collapsed, then we had Hollywood come in and celebrate him. And But it still took, I think, till, uh, until 2009 or 2012, I'm not sure, I think 2009, until they finally removed Nelson Mandela and the ANC from the, from the terrorist list in the United States, well after Nelson Mandela left office. So Hamas is a national liberation organization. Their people have been expelled from their homes. You have the same sort of thing in Europe during the Second World War. You have it in previous to the Second World War. Why is it that the Palestinian people are the ones that they have to lose their land, they have to lose their dignity and honor because some crime that was committed in Europe and then everyone has to allow the Israelis to do whatever they want to these people. It's extraordinary. Said Mirandi, I'm running out of time here, but thank you so much, and thank you also, Greg. It's a, it's such a, a, a minefield, you know, such a, a, a laden topic uh, to attempt to discuss. But thanks both for taking part in that uh, in that discussion, in a in a civilized and even-handed way. Thank you both for your uh, for your contributions tonight. Thank you, Said Mirandi. Thanks again to uh, Mohammed uh, Saeed Marandi there for joining us. Don't go anywhere because coming up, it's lecturer, commentator and thinker Ralph Schulhammer. Yes, indeed, it is that time again when we get the thinking that is hammer time. Welcome back to the Neil Oliver Show. My final guest, as is traditional now, is lecturer, commentator, thinker and friend, Ralph Scholhammer. Uh, I, um, I uh, love this opportunity that I have with Ralph and, with, and with, with Greg in this instance to be a little bit more philosophical and to let the conversation breathe a little bit. Uh, and I, I've got a little bit of advanced warning about what Ralph's going to talk about. And it made me think about the fact that a, a civilization or a city or, or a it's essentially a dream shared by the people who live there. And when the moment comes that not enough people continue to dream the same dream, then essentially that civilization or that city or whatever disappears as though it had never been. You know, it's held together by that shared thought. And I know that, Ralph, I think you want to talk about the way in which you fear we are losing the youth, the, the, the upcoming generation and that you may indeed be drawing upon the wisdom of uh, the sociologist Emil Durkheim to help you make your case. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, Durkheim, he's kind of the, the forefather or the founder, some would claim, of modern sociology. And I know that these days, for good reason, sociology has a little bit of a sketchy reputation, but I would argue that back in the late 19th century, it was a serious science. And uh, Durkheim observed something quite interesting. He said, as societies modernize, kind of a normlessness sets in and, and people get more lonely. Right? People get, 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 you know, they, they drift apart. And I think this is something we see today as well. Many of the phenomena that we discuss so often on your show, but we also see being debated in the commentary section, the newspaper, I think is a symptom of this. And the reason why I refer to the youth is I think they feel it more than anybody else. You, Neil, myself, I think we're old enough. We still grew up in a society that had a shared narrative that kind of was tied together by, the, by an idea what our community is, what our nation is, what our heritage is. But I think this has broken away for reasons we can talk about in greater detail in recent years. So what you see happening are all symptoms of this normlessness. So the youth, depending where they come from, they turn to a form sometimes of immature nationalism. They turn to environmentalism. If they have a migrant background, they very often turn back to the, the cultural anchors of their ancestry and where they came from. Um, we see within the elites that they kind of projected normlessness in an obsession with foreign countries, whether it be Gaza, Israel, or Palestine, right? So there's this combination of the rejection of your own thing, but the hold that this leaves, this normlessness, then makes them latch on to all other kinds of things. So what then happens, and this is really, I think, an important point, because you talk about this so often in such, a, in such an eloquent way. As societies, as these communities drift away, the government has a harder and harder time keeping the nation together because it is no longer in any sense a nation. So what they then have to do, they have to use ever more authority in ever, I would say, mad or crazy ways to keep something together that in many areas no longer wants to stay together. And this is, I think, what we see currently happening in so many countries in the West and in Britain in particular. The the state then automatically, almost by default, turns into a police state because it tries to keep it together. And again, instead of looking at the broader picture with this, as we no longer have a shared narrative, they try to fight the symptoms. As you see in our bit, you know, no longer post something on social media, uh, no longer say this, no longer say that. And I think this is a huge problem. We no longer talk about the root causes, which is that a society that no longer has anything in common, no longer has what we would call common sense. But without common sense, you end up in a situation where relationships are no longer managed by the community itself, but it needs to be managed by the state. And this is, in my opinion, slowly but surely, a way into an authoritarian system. And we see this in the UK and in other parts of the world as well. And, and so do you think that um, the if the if the authorities face this challenge that you talk about, you know, if they can't, if they can't, if that cohesion breaks down, then they, you know, then they lose, then they lose that control. Do you do you believe in your heart that our powers that be still want to retain and to pass on that sense of cohesion, or on the contrary, are they actually deliberately working towards the very atomization of society that we see? Do they have the mistaken yes. sense that an atomized society better serves their needs? Absolutely, absolutely. I think what you said is one is one thing. The second one is I honestly believe that they really do not understand the importance of cohesion. I mean, you see this in schools. I believe there's this famous saying after the Napoleonic Wars. I think it was Wellington who said that the war against Napoleon was won on the playing fields of Eton. And what he meant was that British identity, British confidence was taught in schools. We now do the exact opposite. We teach all these craziness in diversity, all these, these weird ideologies that are by design, you know, drifting people apart you see this now people look if you tell them that you know from our previous conversations i'm a patriot I'm, I, I believe in national identity but if you say that national identity is not the thing that works it has to be something else people will not replace it with something higher they will actually will replace it with something on you know kind of a smaller group so people of color will all of a sudden identify again with their color people of muslim heritage will start to re-identify with the muslim heritage white people who kind of not feeling comfortable with identifying with being white which is by the way also happening they start to identify with you know trans genderism, uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, environmentalism. So what we see is that as, as we lose nationalism, it's not replaced by cosmopolitanism, with the exception of, I think, the very small elites that you talk about, the guys who chat back and forth between, you know, London, Davos, Brussels and Washington. But it's actually replaced with tribalism. So our societies become more and more tribal, which, of course, makes 
good governance more and more difficult because the only thing the government ends up doing is trying to manage all the quarrels and tensions between those tribes that no longer share anything in common. Now, the good news, I believe, is that people like you, people like me, people like Greg, if we have this conversation, and I'm not claim, claiming that I know the answers, I'm currently at the stage of trying to identify the problem, that this can be reversed. I think that most people like community, they like cohesion, but we have to find this shared narrative and especially then communicate it to the young people because those are the ones I'm most worried about that we are going to lose. G Greg, I wonder if this to some extent is the consequence intended or otherwise of, of having our civilization increasingly babysat by technology. You know, yeah. people are, are, it's the lack of hearing the dream and the story and the narrative from parents, from wider society. Yeah. And, and too many of us have been left, the younger generation have been left just looking at AI. It's, tra it's tragic. And, and these kids on their phones, they don't socialize anymore. You know, I used to tell my children, they were very social, so we raised them the right way. But if they had their phone, I would say, watch TV. And my parents spent, <laughs> you know, 30 years telling their children not to watch TV. Yeah. But, but I think it's more social. And, and it was great to see. It's you know, a shared experience. Yeah, yeah. Except, you know, when you're sitting with your buddies watching a movie, you're playing, even playing video games, which again, I try not to encourage, but having my son and his friends in, in our, our home socializing was better than sitting in, alone in a room on a mobile phone. And I think the other thing that Ralph makes a great point about patriotism, and, but it also goes down to the micro, to, the, to civic organizations, to families, right? Obviously, the, the research is compelling that a two-parent household is better for children. But also, when you go to the community, the, I hate to use that word community because it's overused mm -hmm. when they talk about ethnic communities. But, you know, you can't do this to that community. But, but in real communities, there is, there's civic activity. And in, in many usually wealthy or educated communities, it still exists. And, you know, you have the church, and that's number one. Now, granted, church attendance is down enormously in the West, and it's been replaced, as Ralph pointed out, by the existential crisis of climate change or an obsession with mm -hmm. Gaza, you know. So they're, they're replacing the, the church or, or, or religion, organized religion, but, but you still have it, and it still works, and there are par parades in the towns that I've lived in in America, Mem Memorial Day, parades with military and bands and, you know, the baseball team marches down the street. It still exists and it's coming back and it has in Virginia and Florida and Texas still thriving. Ralph, do you think possibly that people have, are culturally em embarrassed, too embarrassed to be proud about their, their local story and their national story? You know, are, are, are people being sort of invited to think that that celebrating and belonging to and honouring and being inspired by the past is somehow, you know, just embarrassing and to, and to be left behind. And have we, have, have we in that way thrown out the baby with the bathwater? It's, it's a great question. First of all, I think you're 100% uh, uh, right. There was a, a couple of decades ago, he, he died a, a few years back, uh, the late anthropologist, anthropologist Edgerton, if I pronounce his name correctly, please forgive me. He wrote a fantastic book of what he calls cultural maladaptation. And what he meant by this is that there's general agreement that we as a species are generally social, right? So we create communities and we then usually build these communities on shared rituals and shared beliefs and shared narratives. But he argues that you can actually have self you can have self-destructive cultures and ideas as well and i think precisely what you describe falls into this category if you create conditions also what greg i think correctly pointed out if you create conditions where traditional community life you know neighborliness uh, going to church people i think very often confused the point about church going is not so much the theological aspect it's the going to church aspect. You meet members of your community. You ask how they're doing. You ask, can I help with your children? You know, I heard your father is sick. Is there anything I can do for you? You create a sense to people that, wait a moment, I'm not alone. And this is, I think, the, the main effect. So it's not just, the, the again, the theological part. And this is, I think, the time we find ourselves in. We have become an over-individualized society. And let me just put a few numbers to this, just real quick. Um, over the last year, almost any Islamist terrorist attack that was planned or executed was done by people, mostly young men, under the age of 20. Um, the most radical members of last generation and just sub oil are under 20. Uh, the, the part of society where the transgenderism is most prevalent is, uh, is uh, young people under 20. We see it with the Gaza movement. We see, so so, all, so there is something going on. This is the thing. 
People need, and this is what Durkheim always said, Durkheim said, people need something that goes beyond their mere existence. They want to be part of something higher. And if our society can no longer offer something, then young people will look, some, will look for that higher meaning somewhere else. And very often these can be destructive sources. I would rather like to channel it into something constructive, like a sense of enlightened patriotism. Something, you know, that they say, okay, our history is not perfect, but there's a lot to be proud of. That being British is a wonderful thing. That being born in the United Kingdom is in many ways like winning the lottery of life compared to the rest of the planet. I think this kind of healthy confidence um, would allow us to achieve so many things that we that kind of otherwise are about to slip away. I, um, I, you made me think there, literally, just, just as you were speaking there, I, uh, reasons to be proud, you know, here in Britain, you know, we've definitely been bombarded over the last, goodness knows, 20, 30 years to think that the British Empire is only bad news. You know, that whole imperialist, colonialist mindset that we're just told and the children are told that there was everything about that was wrong. And but I'm, I'm minded of, of uh, George Santayana, who's a Spanish-American uh, philosopher, who's, who said, now this is a Spanish-American, who said of the British Empire that not since the Athenians had the world had such sweet, just, boyish masters. <laughs> In reference to the to the administrators of the British Empire. Now that, and I'm not, you say what you like about the British Empire, but when did you last hear someone say of the British Empire that not since ancient Greece has the world been ruled by such sweet, just, boyish masters? You're not invited to even contemplate that. Let me, the, the, the historian Neil Ferguson has written a wonderful book almost 20 years ago with the titles so that your viewers can look it up uh, called The Great Degeneration, where he looks at communal and public life in the United Kingdom, which was at a high point in the 19th century. I want to make something very clear to all your viewers and listeners. The British were not powerful because they had an empire. The British had an empire because they were powerful. And one of the reasons why Britain was more powerful than the rest of the world is because to a large extent they figured out how to create a national community, how to create a national identity. If you look at the money the British had to spend, for example, for security and safety at home, I mean, the bobbies, the police, that was something that only became necessary right, at some point due to urbanization and, and all these other factors. But this is a huge misunderstanding in the way we tell history. By the way, the same is true about the Romans. The same is true about Islam, right? Every empire. The, the empire is the consequence of a community, a society figuring out how to organize themselves and becoming powerful, not the other way around. And I think this is something where we have to set the record straight. Ralph Schulhammer, once again, I have only a barely had the opportunity to open up this box of ideas. Thank you so much, Ralph Schulhammer. Thanks, we'll speak Neil. again soon. You've been watching the Neil Oliver Show on GB News. Thank you to all my guests. We'll be back next week. Thank you, Greg.